Good evening everyone, Country Flyboy here, and today, ILS Tutorial. So, this is going to be a three-part video. Um, I've been poking around, and there's not any good ILS tutorials out there for Flight Simulator. Most of them seem to be videos of someone with just flying in their simulator, they got music playing in the background, and text pops up on screen telling you what to do. Um, I'm not... I'm not happy with that. I don't want to make just another crap ILS tutorial video, so I'm not just going to teach you how to fly the, tutorial, the ILS in Flight Simulator, because there's more to it than just programming the GPS, setting the frequency, setting the CDI, and then hitting the autopilot button. No. Today, we're going to be going in ILS approaches in a three-part video. So the first part, we'll be talking about the ILS itself, how what, what is an ILS, what are its components, and uh, we'll touch a bit on the different parts of the approach. Um, then we'll actually demo fly the approach in this Coronado Cessna Caravan EX with a beautiful G1000 glass cockpit. We'll be flying from Macon to Albany, so it's a short 30 minute flight and ends with an ILS approach. So we'll be flying a full procedure ILS approach today. Although most of the time you probably won't need to do the full procedure ILS approach. You could just get radar vectors to the to final. And then lastly, we'll go over some more advanced stuff regarding the ILS approach, specifically the different approach categories, ILS auto land or critical areas and other things like that. So that will be the tutorial. I uh, hope you enjoy it. Let's get started uh, first talking about what makes up an ILS approach. So let's get started. So, an ILS approach is nothing more than an instrument approach, and like any other instrument approach, it's designed to take you safely down to the runway. However, an ILS approach is different, and it's called a precision approach. Precision approach means it has both lateral and vertical guidance to bring you safely down to the runway. Aircraft will fly along radio beams to bring them down, and they will have an instrument in their cockpit similar to the one you see in the top left. This instrument will have two lines on it that indicate where the radio beams are relative to your aircraft. If your aircraft drifts to the left, the, the, line, the vertical line will drift to the right, indicating you are left of the course and need to correct to the right. Conversely, if you drift too low, the horizontal line will drift up, indicating you are too low and need to arrest your descent to get back on the proper guidance. So, the lines indicate where the course you should be on is, and where you need to correct to. The ILS consists of two parts. The glide slope, which is a UHF radio transmitter transmitting a radio frequency to give you vertical guidance. And the localizer, which is a UHF radio transmitting to give you lateral guidance. The two radio transmitters work together and broadcast a signal not unlike that that is shown here. So, the transmitters will be placed somewhere close to the runway, with the localizer being placed at the far end of the runway, and the glide slope being placed somewhere near the 1000 foot markings in the touchdown zone. Now this is the best place to put them. That doesn't mean they'll always be there. Sometimes they may be in a different place. But this is the best place and the place you will most likely see them. Now these transmitters do have a limited range. Most notably this is the range of the localizer. As you can see it transmits its signal at 35 degrees for the first 10 nautical miles and 10 degrees for 18 nautical miles. The glide slope is similar, only that it's turned vertically on its side. So basically the localizer and the glide slope are a similar radio transmission, except the glide slope is turned vertically. Alright, let's get the bare bone basics out of the way first. Yes, all you need to work to use the, the ILS in Flight Simulator is tune the ILS frequency to the NAV1 radio, And make sure your navigation source is set to, uh, to NAV, not GPS, NAV. And that is it. The uh, ILS localizer and glide slope should now appear on the NAV1 CDI. Although programming the GPS would be helpful, 
it is not required and it does but it is recommended because it does give you an idea of where the ILS is in relation to everything else also setting the CDI OBS uh, inbound courses is also not required because the localizer is only one course but it's also helpful to get you to visualize where you are on the approach so yeah that's it tune the nav one radio and make sure your nav source is set to nav but there is more to it than that that's just the basics to get it to work there is a lot more to it than that so let's go over what is a lot more involved process there are other parts to the ILS in addition to what we've already discussed. Now this is how the ILS is normally depicted in a flight simulator, a, yellow, a green triangle extending from the runway. The additional parts are parts of the ILS that give you distance information to the runway. Now that can be done by localizer DME. It can also be done by the more traditional marker beacons. Marker beacons are specific parts on the ILS that will tell you how far from the threshold you are. So the first marker beacon is the outer marker. The outer marker indicates it's the position at which you will intercept the glide slope if you are at the intermediate altitude listed on the approach chart. The next one is the middle marker and this is the decision height at which point you will be 35 100 feet from the runway threshold and 200 feet above the threshold. So this basically is the decision point on a normal Cat 1 ILS approach. Norm more on the categories later. And the inner marker is the marker at which you are at the decision point for a Cat 2 ILS approach. Sometimes you may find the outer marker mixed with a uh, NDB in the same place, in this, which case it's called a locator outer marker. That way you always have an indication of where the outer marker is. So aircraft flying along the ILS will have an instrument like that in the cockpit in addition to the CDI that we showed earlier. This is the outer marker indication, the OMI indicator as I call it. This indicates where you would be on the approach. Uh, when you pass these different markers, these lights will light up, as well as a tone will play if you have the uh, marker audio enabled. Let's watch an aircraft fly along the localizer here and see what that looks like. Okay, here he comes. As he passes the outer marker, you can see the uh, outer marker lights up, and you can also hear the tone on the audio. passing the inner marker, inner marker lights up, and there's the tone. Alright, so here is a cross section of the ILS glide slope. Now, a new term is introduced with ILS approaches, and that term is Runway Visual Range, or RVR. All RVR is, is a new way of measuring the visibility. Uh, it is there is a transmitter measuring device somewhere near the threshold of the runway and that is what measures RVR uh, and basically RVR is just runway visual range and it's visibility from the down the runway from the threshold given in feet it will be posted in the METARs of the airport when it needs to be so it's not posted all the time just when the weather is bad enough that it needs to be posted so let's look at this METAR here the underlying part is how you would see RVR. As you can see here, the uh, first part of the underlying section, R04-P1500N. That indicates that runway 4 has a visual range of 1500 feet. And the second part, R22-P1500U, indicates runway 22 has a RVR 1500 feet. Now, the N or the U suffix indicates the change from the previous METAR. So, the N indicates that there has been no significant change in this visibility since the last METAR. 
the uh, U indicates that the visibility has improved. So uh, the last METAR runway 22 had a lower runway visual range than runway 4, uh, but at the moment both of the runways indicate a 1500 foot visibility and there is no significant change from runway 4. Now, there is also a decision altitude as you descend down the glide slope in addition to the runway visual range. Both of these are the minimums and you need to make sure that you can meet these minimums before flying the approach. So, run, so high lessons are divided into different categories based on how low their minimums go. Uh, a Cat 1 has a decision altitude of 200 feet and an RVR of 2400 feet. Cat 2 has a decision altitude of 100 feet and an RVR of 1,200 feet. Now Cat 3 is somewhat special in that Cat 3 does not have a decision altitude. So the decision, there's no decision altitude for all Cat 3 approaches and their only minimum is the runway visual range. So a Cat 3A has an RVR of 700 feet. A Cat 3B has an RVR of 150 feet. And a Cat 3C has no minimum visibility and allows landings in even zero, zero conditions. 